During our class videos, you may hear our poets and playwrights use terms that are new to you. We have created a list of key terms and definitions that you can refer to at any point during our video lectures. This list is available on the Videos and Readings class page, where you can read it or download it as a PDF. If you would like to find and review these terms while you watch each class video, you can stop this video, go back to the Videos and Readings class page, and download the PDF. There you can play this video in each of the following class videos. If you have any questions about these terms, we encourage you to ask your teaching team in the weekly class discussions. Samuel D. Hunter's plays include A Bright New Boise, The Whale, The Few, Rest, and A Great Wilderness, among others. In 2014, he received a MacArthur Fellowship. He is a resident playwright of New Dramatist, an ensemble playwright at Victory Gardens, and a member of Partial Comfort Productions. Uh, so my name is Sam Hunter, and I'm a playwright. Uh, I am originally from a town in northern Idaho called Moscow. Uh, it's a, a community that's a mix of an agrarian community, a lot of farmers, and then there's also a university. So growing up, I had uh, both this uh, very rural community that I was very deeply connected to. My family goes back about six generations in my hometown. Um, and also this, this university, which was this really uh, wonderful little window into the larger culture in the middle of this farming community. Um, and I first got interested in playwriting then, and I ended up going to college, and I studied playwriting in college, and I ended up coming here to the University of Iowa and getting my master's degree. And since then, I've been living in New York, uh, and I've been uh, a playwright and also done a little bit of screenwriting um, as well. So I feel that uh, playwriting is this very specific type of writing because unlike other modes of writing, it's time-based. Uh, the, like the way that we normally talk about lengths of plays is not number of pages, it's number of minutes. Uh, which is very unique to playwriting. And I think because it's this time-based uh, form that it actually, f it feels very much like it has uh, an arc to it. In, a, in the same way that, you know, a, a poem will have an arc or a novel will have an arc, but, but this arc is very, it's uh, measured out in terms of minutes. Uh, and because of that, I think that I realized very early on that and this is not the same with everybody. Everybody writes differently. But I realized for me, I can't really start a play until I know what the end is. Or at least have an idea of what the end is. And often by the time I get there, it'll be completely different than what I thought. I mean, it'll still maybe have the, the sort of the emotional uh, moment that I wanted or the, or the, you know, the feeling that I was going for. But the, the, it might manifest in a completely different way than I thought. And the reason for that is I, it almost feels like plays are, um, they're like road trips almost. Like you're, you get this audience in a room and you tell them, okay, we're going to Albuquerque. And, and we we're all in this car and we know the play is going to be done when we get to Albuquerque. And, and I think this, this is not uh, common to every single play, but I think it's, it's common to a lot of plays that there's this sort of engine that's, that started at the beginning and uh, it becomes the, the, the guiding principle of the whole play. And so for me, I kind of need to know what Albuquerque is <laughs> before I can start driving. And, um, and so what that allows me to do in the same way that you, know, you might have a thematic idea that you're always trying to chase down, or maybe a political or social idea that you're always trying to chase down, if I know where my characters are ultimately going or where I'm very gently trying to guide the drama ultimately, it allows me to keep moving forward and to have um, a certain amount of confidence that we're going to a destination rather than just sort of like driving into the night and having no idea where we're going. Uh, and I think that an in, in audience and, and also a reader uh, can sense that confidence when they're reading a play, that if they feel like they're almost in safe hands uh, when they know that they're being led somewhere, and it could be somewhere really dangerous, it could be somewhere unexpected, but if they're felt, if they, an audience can sense when they're being 
you know, carried along. Uh, and for me, that, that sense of an ending is what allows me to ultimately put together the entire play. Uh, and sometimes it's really surprising. The last, the, the play that I'm working on right now, I, I had a really concrete sense of what the ending was. Um, and I think that ending is pretty much what I thought it would be. It's a little different. But, uh, but I remember when I started writing the play, I thought, okay, this play is probably a short play. This is probably an 80-minute play. Uh, and I wrote the first draft, and it's well over three hours long. And, uh, and it's because along the way, all of a sudden I found all of these detours and, and nooks and crannies that I didn't really realize were there when I first started writing. Um, but it's, it's almost like it feels like the play is this balloon that gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you're writing it. Um, but you can feel like you're always going forward with some amount of confidence because you know what the destination is. Um, so, uh, you know, one thing that they, they all, one of the sort of big truths about drama is that it's uh, conflict producing change, you know. And so when we think about conflict, we always think about opposing forces. Um, and so I think, you know, early on in my writing, my approach to that was to think about, uh, you know, you, you have two characters and they're in a setting and when you're thinking, well, okay, conflict, well, that, that then is argument. So you have one character who represents one side of an argument and then another character who represents the other side of an argument. And that's, that's a valid way to write a scene. But if you think about real life, <laughs> real life is often much more complex than that. And, and I think, you know, there's conflict, there's surface level conflict between character X and character Y, but I think the deeper, the deeper level of conflict is internal conflict within each of these characters. Uh, and I think that is the, the richness uh, that, bring, that brings three dimensions to characters, is that characters can hold two separate thoughts in their head that are competing with one another, and that's what creates that internal conflict. And I think that, as a writer, that's what I'm most interested in, is that internal conflict and how that manifests in the world. Uh, and if you think about this, this is not a new idea. I mean, you know, one of the most famous lines in all of drama is to be or not to be, you know, which is a monologue from Hamlet uh, where he's, it's a monologue about ambivalence. <laughs> I mean, it's not a monologue where he's trumpeting his own truth or, or you know, uh, arguing with somebody at a point. It's a monologue about trying to hold two very opposing thoughts in his head at the same time. And I think that's what makes it one of the brilliant monologues of Shakespeare is that, is that it, these two different ideas that seem far apart from one another uh, it brings so much oxygen and humanity into the character. Uh, so, you know, often when I think about putting characters into a landscape, you know, I do think about the, there is the, that conflict between two characters, but often, you know, you have a character who's in conflict with another character who can also see their point of view, and therein lies the tragedy, is that, you know, they, they're pushing against something that they know maybe they shouldn't be pushing against. Uh, and it's that internal conflict that's so relatable and so dynamic. Uh, you know, one of, um, one of the great definitions of tragedy, I think, is Hegel's definition of tragedy, which is two noble forces that cannot coexist. I think I'm getting that right. <laughs> Uh, and what I've always taken that to mean is that it doesn't need to be, a, a, you know, when you think about protagonists and antagonists, it doesn't necessarily mean virtue and evil. This just means two opposing forces, and, um, and they are complicated, and they have their own internal conflicts, and it's not so easy as good guy, bad guy, black and white. Uh, and that's what feels like real life, and that's what feels dynamic, and that's what can give you fuel for a full-length play, you know, or a full-length novel rather than just like one scene where there's two people shouting at one another. I've been writing plays for, for a while. I started writing plays when I was quite young, and I think like any young artist, I tried to, uh, I spent many years trying to figure out what my voice was. Uh, and, uh, and I guess what I mean by voice is what what I had to offer that was perhaps different or unique, something, you know, in, in a very crowded field of a lot of people writing plays, what, what was the thing that, that, that I wanted to offer that felt uh, singular? 
Um, and for a while I thought, well, maybe this is experimentation with form in a way that people aren't doing. And I, and I found that, that when I was younger and I tried to write things that were really formally inventive or experimental, it, 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 it kind of felt a little hollow. Like I wasn't very good at it. Some people are really good at that kind of experimentation. I'm just not. Um, and it, it felt kind of like formal gymnastics that, that weren't really toward a, a greater end. Um, so I... I started to rethink what it was that I felt like I had to offer, and it really brought me back to uh, where I'm from, which I think is where a lot of writers start. They, you, I mean, everybody's heard the old adage of write what you know, and uh, I mean, people say it so often it's kind of meaningless now, but, but it actually uh, holds a lot of truth. I think that within that they're saying that the, the uh, specificity is what really makes narrative universal in this really kind of surprising way that that the more specific the more um the more singular you can make your characters and your settings all of a sudden in this really impossible way it becomes hugely universal uh and i think it's because everybody recognizes that specificity and they can they can um, bring that own specificity and in, into their own writing and recognize it in their own lives um, so I started writing plays that night out, and I started writing about the community that I came from. And, um, you know, I think something that is kind of hard to parse now in our narrative, which tends to be very coastal and very urban, uh, you know, it's a lot of stories, especially in film and TV, it's the, the narratives tend to be New York, LA, Chicago, uh, and mostly New York, LA. And, uh, and I think that there's this idea that, that rural Idaho is the same as rural Wisconsin is the same as rural Tennessee is the same as rural Texas, where in reality they're hugely different from one another. Um, and so I really kind of focused my sights on the, on the community that I knew, which was Idaho, rural Idaho, and specifically northern Idaho. Uh, and I think that I tend to focus on characters who... Um, are hovering sort of around the poverty line, uh, which in all honesty is not how I grew up. My dad was a, an emergency physician, uh, but uh, a lot of my family members and the majority of the community that I was within uh, were not people who were making a ton of money. Um, and so I kind of feel like at this point in my career, uh, that's the community and that's the landscape that I'm really interested in in focusing on because I feel like there is a, a lack of it in our larger cultural dialogue. Uh, and I think that as we've seen, you know, in recent political events, that part of the country has a voice and uh, they won't be silenced. And they are a very complicated uh, segment of society that has like a lot of their own concerns that, are, that I think don't get reflected in our narrative now, uh, in, in our film, in our TV, in our plays. Um, and so that's what I've been focusing on, mainly. I, I really try not to approach character with, um, with like a political idea or a social idea in mind. I, I think that, for me at least, the, the strongest plays that I've written have the the political or the larger ideas always grow from a very very uh, simple human story uh, and um, so you know for instance I have this play called The Whale um, that's one of my more produced plays and it's a play that I think ultimately is uh, about you know a father trying to reconnect with a daughter which is a very very human very simple thing that I think is very universally relatable uh, but surrounding this very universal core narrative, you know, this, this man is morbidly obese. He weighs 650 pounds. He lives in this tiny apartment in a, in a, uh, small apartment building in Idaho. Um, there's a Mormon missionary who shows up. So there's all these like, uh, very idiosyncratic elements to the story, but it's all hovering around this very, very simple human story about a father and a daughter. Uh, and... And I think that whenever I write a play, even if it is getting at larger sociopolitical ideas, it's always um, hanging off the clothesline of this very human narrative, uh, because that's the thing that actually locks an audience in. 
Uh, and sometimes in my writing, if I feel like I'm getting lost, um, I try to think of that very human narrative as my North Star, so that I can always sort of, you know, if writing a play feels like you're steering a ship through waters, and, and sometimes you feel like you're going off course and you have no idea where the play is going, and the characters seem to be going off in this direction you never even intended, but, but you can always sort of like look to that, that North Star, and for me in that play it was a father trying to reconnect with a daughter, and that, that can always calibrate uh, wherever you're trying to take your story, wherever it, it goes. And, it, and for me it allows a lot of freedom to go in different directions and explore different facets of the character or the setting uh, because you always have that singular uh, thrust to the whole story. The, the thing that when I usually uh, am starting a new play, uh, the thing that usually attracts me to an idea is the sort of landscape of the idea. Uh, and that could be, and I don't mean necessarily a literal landscape, uh, sometimes it is. I mean, you know, I have a play that, uh, that's set in the break room of a, a big box store. And for me, it was the landscape of that, of that, I, of that territory of a big box store in, in southern Idaho that really attracted me to that idea. And, and, uh, um, and then once I have that landscape, once I have that sort of feeling, one thing I ask myself is, is when I populate that landscape with people, uh, sometimes for me, the most important thing is to find a voice to put in that landscape that feels actually very at odds with their circumstances. Because if we, if we think about drama, uh, you know, if the essence of drama is conflict on certain levels, then uh, when, when a character is put in a landscape in which they maybe don't belong, or that is at odds with the character, then essentially out of that you get conflict, which is drama. Uh, so for instance, I had that play that's set in a big box store. Uh, I chose to, as the main character, uh, write a fundamentalist Christian who was praying for the rapture and put him into this landscape because I felt that the, the sort of quotidian, oppressive, white-walled, fluorescent, you know, uh, nature of this big box store was uh, at complete odds with this man who is searching for the divine. Uh, and out of those two ideas, which are so far away from one another, uh, was generated a lot of uh, conflict and ideas and, and basically the, 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 the foundation of the play came from those two ideas. So when I approach character, uh, like I said, that often when I approach character, I feel like uh, I'm very interested in writing characters who might be very hard to identify with for certain audience members, like a 650-pound man sitting on a couch in a small apartment in Idaho. Um, and uh, I feel like one of my tasks as a dramatist is to invite an audience's sense of empathy for these people that might that they may be a, might be surprising that they find themselves empathizing with them, uh, and I think that it's it's very important for me as a writer to draw a distinction between empathy and sympathy, uh, and I think that sympathy is is maybe a little easier. It's maybe a little cheaper. Uh, sympathy can be garnered by you know giving a character cancer or uh, having a, you know, a character apologize for something, or you know, like it's, 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 if you think about it, it's sort of like making a character a little pathetic, or, or, or sort of like depressing them so we can reach out to them. But I don't know if that's really the same thing as empathy, because sympathy sort of invites um, a sense of, of sorrow, or, or a sense of despair for that person, but I don't know if it's really a true sense of empathy. I think more, Empathy is a bit more complicated. Empathy is uh, uh, being able to understand and hold in your head a character's worldview and a character's perspective, uh, which I think is really tricky to generate that without doing things like making the character, uh, you know, just inviting that character to be like pathetic and asking and sort of begging for the audience's sympathy. Uh, and I think one one or two ways that I try to do that is by putting characters who might be hard to empathize with 
in really simple, recognizable situations. You know, I, I said before that the whale was about a father trying to reconnect with a daughter, and that is a very simple emotional core that is universally recognizable and, and, and very easy to get on board with. Uh, and, um, and in the same way, I have this play called The Bright New Boise that's about uh, a man who's a fundamentalist Christian who's praying for the rapture and he works at this big box store. And most of the people coming to see this play have very little in common with this character. Uh, but in that play, like in The Whale, he's actually trying to reach out to a son, uh, which is a son that he hasn't seen in 15 years. And so this is a very human story. It's very relatable. It's very, um, uh, it's very recognizable, I think, uh, in its universality. Uh, and if, if you think about some of the great plays of history, uh, yes, they're about kings or queens or whatever, but their, their basic task in the play or sort of the emotional life of the character in the play is very recognizable. Um, it's often about love. It's about, uh, it's about family. It's about these sort of like eternal, you know, uh, these eternal signposts of human history that, that everybody can, can, can get on board with, everybody can recognize. When you're writing anything, and I think this as this is a play or this is a poem or this is a novel, I think one of the hard things about writing it is you can't keep it all in your head at once. It's the project is just simply too massive uh, to try and you know contain entirely in your head. Uh, there are too many, you know, especially when you're writing a novel or a short story or a play. There are just simply too many characters or too many ideas or too many. You know, uh, there's just too much in your basket to, to to be able to like lift it up and see it all at once, and so I think that one of the one of the tricks that I always try to use, or one of the tools that I always try to to implement, is ways of thinking about your play in in very elegant ways. And what I mean by elegance, uh, it's like the mathematical idea of elegance, which is, uh, you know, equations that are the simplest possible equations that, that reveal the greatest possible truths. Uh, and so when I think about, when I'm sitting down and here's this play that I'm writing and it's, you know, it's 20,000 words, which is, you know, too much to hold in your head. But if I think, okay, what is the sort of elegant equation of this play? And if, if, you know, with a play like Oedipus Rex, the elegant equation of that play is who murdered Laius. It's three words. Uh, and it's something that every scene uh, can be guided by that principle. Uh, it's, it's what Aristotle talks about when he talks about unity of action. Uh, but I think we can also talk about that in terms of unity of theme uh, in the way that, you know, if you're writing a play... In the way that I uh, was talking about my play, The Whale, it's a father trying to reconnect with his daughter. Um, and that's, that's both theme and it's also action. I mean, it's something, it's a, it's a unifying idea that allows me to hold a very large object at once. Um, and so, so when I approach a new play, uh, I think one of the really effective tools for me is to try to figure out those really elegant phrases, those really elegant equations that, that can point to the greatest possible truth that you're getting at.